cool. All right, so hi everyone. And it's so nice to see you in such a big number. I am Yelena and I am one of the organizers of the helpers to organize the BioBliss this year. And together with Jürgen, um, I will be holding today this scientific workshop. Um, first, we will give a little short introduction about just a general idea of citizen science and the scientific part of citizen science. Um, and then after, we will have two very successful citizen scientist project presentations. Um, one, of the, one of them is about the cowslip right from Estonia that I sent in the group already in the group chat with, uh, with the wonderful website and wonderful data collection. And then the other will be from Victor, uh, who is um, training non-scientific community to recognize and sample um, some uh, limnic invertebrates, right? So um, the general idea of citizen science is not something that is really nowadays. And what actually is citizen science is uh, just engaging the community with the science, the science and sur their surroundings and educating them while they contribute to the science. So um, it's basically the idea of having people of many backgrounds engaged and solving some kind of community issues using scientific methods and um, informing people also directly about some environmental issues while they have a hands-on approach to those issues because they will be collecting the data and seeing the results themselves over the years or over one season or whatsoever. So the citizen science, as I said, it's not something that is new. It actually, like, throughout the history, uh, the citizen science has uh, been contributing to the professional science all along. And um, I need the next slide, Jürgen. <laughs> uh, for example, many, um, many not only um, the many important museum specimens and many much like a lot of important data actually came historically from citizen science. Um, for example, here, which, which I found really interesting, um, are these old uh, <clears throat> Japanese old court diaries that um, just provide this really, really long term record of dates of the cherry blossom festivals in Japan. And they are like not intentionally collected data, right? But still, because they were so structured and they were happening every year, it could be used in um, following or observing some trend. And here, this trend is just this cherry blossom. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, citizen science is a very useful approach. But I think now Jürgen will tell us something more about actually the pros and the cons of the citizen science and how can it be used and in which which questions can be actually answered with this approach. Yeah. Hi to everyone also from my side. So in this slides you can see more of the pros. Um, nowadays we have advanced technologies so it's quite easy or more people have access to technologies so they can observe and record different species in nature. And also the technology helps quite often to like get to know what species we are looking at. Then it's also more cost effective to use citizen science quite often because otherwise the scientists will have to maybe travel to some uh, farther away areas from their home country. But now, if it's possible to use citizen science, then, <clears throat> then the people are already in this area. Then it's possible if it's a good citizen science project or just people are doing 
this observing of the species on a constant rate, then it's possible to maybe see even the long term uh, long term trends. And also in some organism groups like <coughs> like uh, bird watchers, uh, ornithologists, uh, they have, have already quite strong commun community that community that are uh, really professional uh, people who know species really well, maybe even sometimes better than the scientists who are only dealing with some some specific groups of birds or other organisms. Okay. Now, if I will compare citizen science and and like ordinary science, if I can so, so if I can say so, then in citizen science we have many people, many observers who can make quite a lot of observers and they can collect a lot of data, but but usually they don't have so much knowledge or so so good uh, like techniques they can't use uh, molecular analysis. So the data that we have a lot of that is less in detail. <clears throat> but compare, compared to that, scientists, uh, there may be less scientists, and, uh, but they can use like uh, more specific methods to study an object. And with citizen science, uh, you have to have the two, you can have a lot of data, but uh, it will be perfect if this data is, uh, if it has a structure, so, so it's comparable between, for example, different countries or different areas. And um, the methods should also be similar so that uh, you can replicate the, the results that you get from citizen science. Otherwise, it may be just uh, a bunch of observations that is really hard to analyze. Yeah, so um, basically because this citizen science data can be really unstructured, um, it, it could be somehow hard to like extract information from it uh, unless you want to prepare your project a little bit in advance. So what, for example, BioBlitz is offering is that on iNaturalist, which is a bit of an unstructured data collection uh, thing, you, the BioBlitz offers already like an umbrella structure in which you can register your own project and make it a bit more structured in case you as a river conserv um, conservationist want to see, uh, for example, some trends in your home river or compare with other rivers and so on. So, for example, to in order to make, let's say, a successful citizen science project that can be potentially comparable and replicable, first thing is to try to figure out what is the question and what is the aim of this project? Is it to follow a trend? Is it to um, just try to figure out some phenomenon? But the point is that if you want to engage more people and if you want to gather quality data that can maybe help you between the years to see trends in your river that are dammed or that are about to be dammed or that you think have any other potential threat, then um, starting from something, something simple is always the key. So it always is good to think about a very clear question that you want answers to. With that question, also you can captivate the engagement actually of your participants, because if you are, sometimes the citizen science projects, they are actually uh, kind of coined by the scientists and the scientists and the non-scientific community often have different interests and they are diff like they have different motivation to engage in a project and uh, with the clarity of the question and the explanation of why this question is important you can get the, in the appropriate engagement right and then uh, also with offering like resources so you always have to think about the resources for your project and if your question can be 
is feasible by using the, resor the resources. For example, if you send birds, if you um, plan your project on the river by just mapping river birds, then you need to know that these people that are volunteers on your project, they need to have binoculars or scopes, or <clears throat> if you are doing aquatic invertebrate research, you have to have another kind of equipment and so on. Um, also, what is a good thing is to think of like a simple protocol, which we will talk about later, that um, your simple question uh, or like your clear question can have can be uh, answered by following this simple protocol. And I think that a lot of people and a lot of like volunteers um, actually will follow even more complex protocols if they know and if they have good reasons to participate. So it's very important that in case, if you want to make your project very structured, if you want to have it repeatable over the years or during one years in different seasons, to have all these questions kind of like clearly set out and to have a simple protocol or a bit complex protocol, uh, whatever you want, in, um, and <clears throat> to hold it and to be consistent with it. And of course, to explain to people why is it important to participate in this project. For example, I can say like for birds, uh, where somehow uh, I think that a lot of, of the public, birds are really popular everywhere and they are everywhere and there's so many bird watchers um, everywhere and bird experts. But somehow, even though birds are really connected to the rivers and they are of course around the rivers, uh, often they are kind of not the main organism that you would look as an indicator of, for example, the river health. And actually, a lot of species globally of the birds, they are connected to the rivers. And I think around 60 species globally are just river specialists, which means that they really depend on their breeding and feeding on the river and its structure, as well as other species, like maybe more than 20% of the species uh, of the birds are actually connected to the rivers in one part of their cycle, life cycle. So either it's feeding or breeding or they live in a forest near the river, it doesn't matter. So actually monitoring the abundance and distribution of this range of bird species with these diverse life histories, different uh, feeding systems can be actually a very valuable tool for assessing the change in river landscape or river hydromorphology. For example, here, these all birds, this would be, um, you can find, oh, I don't know if I can show, no, I cannot show. Can you show Jürgen on the screen, the Cinclus Cinclus, the, the um, dipper? <laughs> Yeah, they're in the middle. So the dippers, for example, they are completely bound to a river and its flow. And it's very, for them, river is like this crucial habitat. And as soon as the changes in the river are made, it affects them directly, as well as many sandpipers and other birds that actually breed near the rivers. And as soon as the river is dammed or the flow is kind of changed, it really affects these species. And that's why it's very important to make a proper monitoring throughout the years of the bird species around the river. However, this is not really easy to do in one step. So if you want to do river, uh, river birds a connect, um, kind of survey for your project, then you need to think about the type of transect that you want to do. For example, for many species, many different transects are um, actually recommended. So um, like usually it would be the transect that you can just walk around the river and then write down every species that you see. But sometimes that's not enough for some birds. So you would have to actually like go in a kayak or even wade in, inside the river and so on. And so now I need the second, the other slide. <laughs> um, so 
that's that's basically the the feeling the thing that you have to choose a transect type and means of transportation around the river and that's important that this thing then does not change so if you choose to walk near the river and watch birds then then you have to walk near the river and watch birds if you choose the walk and then uh, stop every 200 meters to write down the biodiversity to write down the birds around you then you have to stick to that specific uh pattern that you chose and then also stick with it between the years or in the same year. Uh, what is also important is always to think about the time of the day and the time of the year because that can actually determine the um, uh, diversity of birds in the area or their activity and that in their activity, actually the way if you will notice them or not. So whoever is a bit less experienced will maybe not notice or not know how to look for some birds that are maybe active very early in the morning if you get out at like 12 in the afternoon. Also the time of the year is very important because um, for example, in September when the bio blitz is actually happening, the um, many birds are not breeding, at least in Europe, um, at that moment. So they are either resident birds or... Oh, um, there's a question. Oh no, <laughs> of course. So for our violets, we can't have people on the shore and also some in kayaks. No, I think that that does not apply. This is what I was saying that if you want to have um, a specific transect for like bird diversity, then it is recommended to actually like stick with one um, type. But um, if there, because BioBlitz is not only about birds, right, but other thing, other things around, um, that does not matter. But if um, it, it would be recommended to have just one type of transect. But I think in this case, being on a kayak or being on a river, uh, like being a uh, walking next to the river won't be super different. Um, the observations can be still pretty similar to each other, depending on what kind of the river is, what's the vegetation around and so on. But this is just a recommendation. And I think, of course, you can do however you feel it's like the best for this bio blitz event. Mm, yeah, so you should also like think about the your surroundings, as I already said. Um, for example, you can, um, we, as we will also, Jürgen will mention this a little bit later, that if you, because not every bird is just like at the river shore, but a lot of them are in the riparian, riparian forests, um, then it is very important to make some kind of a note um, for yourself about your river flow in that area, uh, the vegetation around the river, if there is any riparian forest nearby, is there other water body present nearby or something like that, uh, which will actually be very useful if you want to um, complement your data with additional kind of variables such as these. Yeah. Okay, we thought that we might bring just some examples that would be interesting to look at. And uh, since quite often there are not many observations about uh, species that live inside the river or quite near the river, then, then we brought this. So there is this black, black fly larva. <clears throat> they live mostly on the hard bottom and in flowing water. And they should be they should be living like all over the world, not only in Europe. And they they are quite often considered as an indicator of a, like free flowing river. And they may be also quite easy to observe on a family level, so that uh, you see in a shallow wet water a stone where just like this. A little sticks are on the stone, so they might be the black whale larvae. And uh, in their life cycle, when they get adult, then they emerge out of the water and then they, they will fly. Then there is this uh, different types of red algae that also many of the species are considered 
as an indicator of a, of a good condition of a river. And uh, it's also something that doesn't need much equipment to observe. So you can just uh, take out the, the rock from the river for a moment and make a photo and observe it. Then we have this uh, water moss, the Fontinale species, which are also all over the world. And they also need quite often free flowing river and uh, hard substrates. And sometimes they're also in an urban river, uh, like they attach themselves to the concrete. And then we have this rice cut grass, that's the cut grass that is <coughs> native to Europe, uh, America, and Asia, but also uh, invasive species, for example, in Australia. And uh, at least in Estonia, it's quite common, but uh, there are not so many observations for the species, so it, it will also be good to like record a species like this. And then there are freshwater mussels that are like really good in educating people about the connectedness of the ecosystem, because <clears throat> all the big mussels that live in freshwater in their beginning of their life, they are parasites to fish. So they need a, another species to survive. And they're also good indicators because uh, the mussels slowly can move slowly and they also need like um, quite clean water to survive. But uh, usually they are really inside the bottom. Uh, so maybe only, it depends from the river, but sometimes only like one centimeter or less is outside from the bottom and it's quite hard to find them. And that's why sometimes on the bottom of the river bed, you can see like traces like this. And when you follow the traces, then we, uh, when you follow the traces, then in the end, sometimes you can find the muscle and then maybe you can take it out for only a short period and make a photo or, or just make a photo from outside the water. Because at least in Europe, uh, the freshwater, uh, the thick shelled uh, river mussel is quite common in rivers, but uh, their numbers are declining and often the officials doesn't have the, uh, they don't know where all the habitats are, so it's good to observe them. <clears throat> then we made a little example protocol just to get you thinking what, what uh, might be maybe a simple protocol and, and how also to like write down what is in the habitat near the, near the organisms that you are observing. For example, I'm not a botanist, but uh, I thought about the protocol that if you want to look, repair and plant diversity, beside a free flowing river or maybe beside a changed river, then you can take a fixed distance, for example, five meters from the line of water, then use some string or other, other thing that you can always have the same area to look plants for. And then if you want to make it really simple, you can just count the different uh, different plants in this area and then, then record it. Or if you want to know what plants are living there, then you can make also photos or use uh, books to, to know what species there are. <clears throat> and then the, down there are, are some notes what to, what to look around if you, if you are in a habitat near the river. So there are river parameters and there are canopy cover, so how much forest is covering the, the river from the sun, and then some human impact uh, parameters. But it's, it's just an example to give some idea. So I think the next one is a presentation from Estonia, but uh, I don't know if there are many, some questions. I will look at the chat for a short moment. OK. 
Okay, I think there are no questions in the chat. Does anyone else have some question? Well, I just I just want to say hello and and thank you, Jelena and Jorgen, for sharing this. I think it was like quite clear, and I just want to point out that these these steps that you shared could really improve the community engagement on any of our river, even if we don't quite intend to take the science like to a high level, all of this information could really help us engage our local communities. So if we are somehow maybe sometimes a little bit afraid of the science terminology, we really need to get a little grasp on this and take it with us when we are actually doing any activity on the biolids. And remember that if we're using iNaturalist, some of this information will be also automatically uploaded when you start sharing those observations. So I don't know if any of the participants will have also some previous experience on, on doing some science surveys or they were never thought they were doing some science surveys. And I will invite uh, some of the audience that we are a lot right now <laughs> to jump into the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's also um, if somebody wants to create, we kind of started this really slowly because a lot of people are actually kind of scared of this science approach. And most of it, it's really, really simple. So it's not any complicated protocol. It's really just a simple protocol that has to be followed. And the most important part is actually to be consistent with it. So not to... Um, to kind of have it and to do things just by the recipe so like cooking but um and that's why if some and that's why we started with this but if somebody wants to organize this project because uh more structured um if somebody needs more information on their river for the sake of conservation for example and if they want to use that data to present to somebody or to have it presentable between the years or within the year or if you compare the free flowing part of your river versus the dam then then it's very then it would be better and it's more representable when you have a little tiny protocol that you can follow and if somebody needs help creating the protocol for example then they can like just contact me or Jorgen and then uh, we could think of something together but I think these things are like very important if you want to follow your river consistently and not only during the bio blitz but like even later you can you can do that sort of, that sort of thing yeah yeah I think I want to add to Jelena's words that <clears throat> You, that's a really nice way to put it, that you can follow this during the year. I think they have in previous bio blitzes that have, after this project, expanded their scope of research. So they have been monitoring the river uh, during the whole year and using a naturalist as a way to document this monitoring. And also then on uh, after you have uh, a good uh, amount of data, you can also start seeing uh, changes in the river for good or for bad and then therefore use that for your community and the river protection Jurgen, you wanted to say something and i think i, I yeah i just wanted to say that sure. the, they were really good comments that that the goal is not only to observe species and some other trends but also the natural education part is really important in, in bioblitz and i think now it's good to take the next presentation because they had a successful uh, data collection for science, but also really huge impact to natural education. I, I think that. So they are two young scientists from, from Estonia, from University of Tartu, and they will speak about their cowslip project. Uh, hello, everyone. I'll try to share my screen. So, as Jürgen said, we are scientists and you talked that um, you are afraid of uh, 
the science part, but I think that many scientists are afraid of coming out of this traditional science uh, kind of a room and talking to people and doing the citizen science. So maybe we could meet in the middle somewhere. <laughs> so uh, we are from uh, University of Tartu, Estonia, uh, Landscape Biodiversity Group, I'm Iris, and also, Marianne said already hi. And we will talk how to reveal some secrets of cowslips with the help of citizen scientists. So first, I want to start a bit further and talk about uh, how we got to this citizen science campaign. And I will start with European grasslands. And um, uh, most European grasslands are semi-natural and one of those is uh, wooded meadows. Uh, but do you think how many species can, plant species can be in this uh, landscape in one square meter? So you can type in the chat the uh, number what you would guess. How many different plant species would fit in this one square meter in these kind of landscapes? Oh, I see 50. <laughs> Anyone else? You can just guess there will be no uh, shaming or something. <laughs> okay. So I see different numbers. Yeah, let's say like between 20 and 50 for now. So um, maybe this will be a little bit of a surprise because uh, the correct answer uh, for this specific meadow, uh, which is in Estonia, is 76, which is quite a lot. <laughs> so, Marianne, can you get the next slide? And uh, this is very close to a world record. Uh, so here we have a graph when uh, in y-axis we have the species number, and uh, x-axis we have uh, the area of uh, where we look, where the species will look. And if we think of uh, this uh, species richness, uh, biodiversity, maybe the first thought is, uh, oh, sorry? Sorry, <laughs> always some people coming uh, in the first time. <laughs> so uh, in a higher or bigger scale, we maybe first think of uh, rainforests, but when we go to smaller scale, like this one square meter, uh, then uh, European grasslands are really stealing the show. Uh, or, or just grasslands in general also, but a lot of these are in Europe. And uh, this lilac wooded meadow, which is in the second place in the world with the 76 species, has also this world record of 42 species in 20 times 20 centimeters, which is uh, quite a lot. If you think about it, this is just the species number, not the individual plant number. So uh, European grasslands are really biodiversity hotspots. But uh, they are, as I said, in the semi natural grasslands and uh, they have uh, uh, evolved and persisted uh, thanks to humans, actually, uh, and this moderate disturbance, which has been mostly grazing or mowing and no fertilization or seed addition or things like that. Uh, and uh, other examples of these grasslands are coastal meadows, alvars, uh, floodplain meadows, and so on. I think uh, you all have seen at least some, maybe here people have seen floodplain meadows most. But uh, the state of these grasslands uh, is really uh, not good. Uh, there has been a drastic decrease in both area and the connectivity, and more than 90% of semi-natural grasslands in Europe have been lost due to the land use change, because uh, not, 
not many people want to have like, I don't know, five sheep and herd them somewhere. So most of these meadows, uh, grasslands have been lost or overgrown. And with that also uh, several species like uh, bird's eye primrose or globe flower, which maybe older people remember, yeah, it was everywhere, but nowadays younger people don't even know what species they are. So uh, this all has got us really worried and we uh, want to study these grasslands and figure out uh, uh, what happens to, for example, plant species when these changes are happening. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so now uh, in our work group, uh, we studied the biodiversity of this grassland plant species. But uh, as mentioned, they can be really, really species rich. So it's really hard to take a, like, uh, to look at all of them or study all of them in more detail. So here uh, comes to our rescue uh, model species. Uh, for us, it's the cowslip. Uh, um, model species, it means that uh, when we study this one plant, uh, we can also make assumptions about other similar plants. So we can concentrate on one species, look it into very detail, do some genetic uh, analysis and everything, and then we can assume that other similar species are on the same track, basically. Uh, so why is this cowslip a good model species? Uh, it's because it's actually very characteristic to these grasslands. It's quite widespread. It's a well-known plant in Estonia. And it also is uh, insect pollinated. Uh, so it's really dependent on these uh, landscapes surrounding it. So it's like um, uh, uh, with these, it's really de dependent on how pollinators move between those different populations uh, of these cowslips. So, um, it can kind of reflect uh, the habitat condition uh, if you study this cowslip. Um, but it's also quite an interesting plant because it has this uh, special uh, trait uh, called heterostyle. Uh, it's uh, this uh, reproductive trait, meaning uh, the cowslips have two different types of flowers. So it's the same uh, plant species, but uh, you can like, uh, look inside one flower and it looks a bit different than the maybe next flower you look into. So these are S-morph and L-morph. Uh, we get these uh, names from their, um, the position of these reproductive organs. So S-morph is with a short uh, style and L-morph is with a long style. So the, uh, they differ from each other uh, from this uh, position of reproductive organs inside the flower. So it's really important there are uh, both types of flowers in one population because they can only reproduce and uh, produce new plants uh, if they can uh, pollinate with each other. So um, it's very important there are both present because if there are, for example, only S-morphs, uh, this population cannot produce any offspring and basically they might go e extinct there. Uh. Uh, so this basically means uh, these uh, cowslips, uh, they care about with whom they mate, <laughs> as people do. Uh, so this, uh, uh, the like point of this uh, is like, uh, like the meaning behind it, why is it uh, evolved, is that with this uh, uh, exchanging pollen between different individuals, between different populations even, this helps to also uh, maintain a higher genetic diversity if they get genetic material from far away, for example. So this means they are like uh, more diverse, uh, they are more uh, uh, more viable. So for example, if there are some uh, like uh, climate change, uh, habitat changes, they could be more uh, uh, viable to these, uh, to these things. <laughs> uh, so it was already, fun fact, it was already Darwin who first started to uh, study these cowslips and this heterostyle, and he was really fascinated by this, uh, <clears throat> uh, by this plant trait. 
so as I mentioned, uh, these both uh, flowers should be in equal amounts in one population. Uh, so if there are like equal amounts of both flowers, there is this optimal uh, optimal balance for this reproduction. But uh, now we get to this uh, how it all connects to these habitats, habitat uh, changes, uh, habitat loss is that with this as these populations are getting like smaller due to habitat loss. This also means this equal balance may start to deviate. Uh, and it cannot even mean that it could happen. There is only one type of morph in one small population. So this uh, could predict that this population will go extinct. Um, so as with this uh, uh, landscape changes, uh, it also means that as it is uh, insect pollinated, plant, it really depends on pollinators. And as we know, the pollinators are, are also in quite a big decline and it's really worrisome. So this uh, further intensifies this problem. So in this uh, graph on the left, uh, we have seen that uh, in uh, smaller cowslip populations, the balance uh, can start to deviate even more. So this uh, zero on this y-axis y here, it means it's equal balance. So you can see in smaller populations, they can deviate uh, very much. And in larger, it's more close to equal balance. And we also have seen that as this uh, equal balance is uh, very, uh, very skewed, very out of balance, uh, it can also start affecting the genetic diversity, that there is uh, uh, not enough suitable mates and uh, they just have to reproduce with their neighbor. And this could mean like uh, bad things for this population. This is uh, just not very viable. Um, uh, so uh, a few years ago, uh, Estonian Fund for Nature, uh, they uh, really wanted to launch a citizen science campaign in Estonia. And they were looking for ideas. Uh, and they had heard about our uh, research on cowslips. And they thought it would could but it could be a really like, like nice uh, study object for citizen scientists because it's a quite uh, well known plant. It's uh, very widespread, and we figured we could uh, uh, make it a really simple task to ask uh, people to find the cowslip population and uh, record this morph balance uh, by looking at 100 flowers and recording if they are S and, or L. Uh, and with this, uh, we wanted to make it as easy as possible to people. They just had to look inside flower and tell us where they are. So we asked them to uh, send uh, GPS coordinates. Uh, so later we could uh, ourselves add some more important information about landscapes or whatever. Uh, so this is how came the idea. Uh, Estonia is looking for cowslips. Um, so it started in 2019. And it was uh, quite uh, successful, <laughs> but it was really uh, like um, much thanks to the Estonian Fund for Nature because they had this uh, really good uh, media and communications people behind it. And they did like amazing work promoting it. Uh, we were in Estonian like primetime news. Uh, uh, we got to invited to talk shows. Um, we, had, we designed this really nice uh, web page that was easy to use uh, to get all the information needed. Uh, so, yes, uh, just as scientists, we couldn't have never done this. <laughs> and uh, thanks to the help of Estonian Fund for Nature, and we got this word all around Estonia, and we got uh, quite many observations. Um, and also, yeah, next year also Latvia joined us, so we got started a bit smaller. And it was a really cool experience for us. It was really different uh, from our uh, other everyday work. So we got a lot of very positive feedback uh, because uh, a lot of schools and even kindergartens participated, which we did not really expect um, because it, uh, it turned out to be a quite good uh, subject for biology lesson, biology lesson as well. So uh, teachers would go out with their whole class to look at cowslips, for example. So we got some really amazing uh, data from that, like uh, so many observations. 
uh, and it was yeah quite interesting. We didn't expect uh, also uh, to get so many different uh, from so many different habitats. So we typically studied on grasslands, but we got also different uh, like road verges, quarries, graveyards, everything. So it really widened also our perspective. Uh, so in the first year, we got more than 1,700 observations from all over Estonia. Uh, the map here shows uh, uh, the observations from two years, so also 2020. Uh, but you can see basically whole of Estonia is covered. Uh, it also uh, represents a little bit where the cowslips actually grow because they are more abundant in the western and northern part of Estonia. Um, yeah, so we were really, really thankful and uh, very surprised about this, uh, uh, how many observations we got, because as scientists ourselves, we could never have gotten this sort of coverage. And thanks to that, uh, we managed to also publish a research article. Um, so it, this data was really valuable and we got to make some science <laughs> and got some interesting results. Uh, one of the main things was that we indeed saw that uh, with, in smaller cowslip populations, the balance uh, was more deviated. So the larger populations, the balance was uh, more equal and in smaller, it was more towards one morph. And it really shows us that it's very important to, um, to protect and uh, keep these larger populations because they are more viable and uh, and uh, we have to really, uh, yes, it's important <laughs> uh, to not let uh, this habit, to not let these whole populations uh, disappear. Uh, and also, we saw it uh, in uh, all uh, both years that there were, for some reason, more S morphs. And this was quite uh, surprising to us because we have always known that they should be in equal amounts. But it was systematically in uh, both years. And we later noticed that it was in our own data set as well when we as uh, scientists went to the grasslands. Um, and it really made us wonder what, what is going on because it, uh, it, like, it raised a lot of new questions basically. But uh, one more thing that we found was that uh, the closeness of human populations, like the bigger the settlements, the more it deviated. So we also saw this negative human uh, influence on these cowslip populations. That So yeah, we could like uh, make some nice assumptions about the habitat quality and the landscape, uh, about the landscapes from that. Yeah. Then we decided to go even bigger and to decided, we decided to expand all over Europe. Uh, it was a scary thought at first <laughs> and we were quite in a hurry, but we still decided to do it. Uh, and then we had to figure out how, how to do a pan-European campaign in the in pandemic <laughs> uh, while we are only in Estonia. So we started to look for uh, partners, uh, so we wrote to a lot of people, to school networks, botanical gardens, research institutions, environmental organizations, all our personal contacts, so everyone we knew who could be even remotely interested or who could know anyone. <laughs> so we did really a lot of writing and uh, we met with people over Zoom calls and uh, it was really <laughs> crazy time looking back. But uh, uh, we got partners from uh, 30 countries and for some countries we got more than one uh, partner. So we really uh, found some amazing people who could help us uh, do the campaign in their country. Can put the next slide. Yeah. And uh, one of the challenges that came with this uh, going international was our web page. 
uh, which was really nice in Estonian, and we uh, we intended to do it uh, in Estonia, but then we had to do it in 25 languages, which was uh, quite a challenge at first. Uh, uh, but we still somehow got all the text translated and everything uh, went fine. Uh, we got a lot of help from our partners. Uh, and uh, we still had this nice web page where we tried to make everything as simple as possible because as scientists, we often want to have like all these details in place. So you do that and just specifically exactly like that and that. But then we had to somehow simplify it a bit and try to explain it so that everyone could understand it. So we tried to really make uh, things uh, easy to understand. And also the uh, observations uh, uh, came to us through the website. So we had the observation form there. And uh, we really tried to make it as simple and easy as possible. And uh, we had pictures that could help. And uh, we asked this uh, flower uh, morph type and uh, some other background questions. And for us, really important was also this uh, uh, GPS coordinates because we could add a lot of data to that. So I would really suggest asking for coordinates as well. And beside the web page, we were uh, also on social media and we made different videos, instructions videos, uh, introducing videos, all kinds of different uh, things. And uh, we really tried to be present on social, social media and also do these uh, paid commercials and all that sort of stuff because we couldn't be physically there ourselves uh, in every country and this helped a lot. But also uh, like a little caution there, don't feed the trolls. <laughs> so you have to manage the people there because uh, some people really want to mess with you. But with all this social media and also traditional media, uh, uh, our communication specialist really, really helped us because we had no idea how communication worked before. <laughs> so it's not just that, oh, I will do a few press releases and that's that. <laughs> it's really a lot of work and uh, we're really grateful uh, to get to from uh, Estonian Fund for Nature who opened our eyes and pushed us and uh, showed us how to actually get to people. So I think that's really important part of this uh, citizen science uh, campaigns that uh, you really have to get to people and uh, even if you think you talk this to everyone and everyone already knows then you gotta do it again and talk to people again. <laughs> and um, uh, just a few results from last year where we uh, went all over Europe so you can see a map there with the observations uh, of course, uh, Estonia is really full, <laughs> also Latvia, because they also had some experience and we had a really great partner in UK, uh, Plant Life. Uh, so those, I think, look the fullest, but it's not that the other countries were lazy, but uh, also it's not so abundant maybe in some countries or there were also some uh, uh, COVID regulations and all, all sorts of things that maybe didn't... Uh, help people to do the observations. But uh, I think we got a lot of information all over Europe. Uh, and uh, with this pan-European data, we also got the same result that we had more S-types, which shows that similar patterns that we found in Estonia are also happening all over Europe, which is really interesting to us. And uh, now we are trying to uh, make another scientific uh, paper out of it, because this is a kind of end goal uh, as scientists. But uh, there has been also other like school projects and uh, some uh, other branching stuff happening, even like uh, mathematics teachers have used uh, this uh, data in their lessons. So it can be really widely used in different ways. You just have to use your imagination. And uh, with this process, we kind of felt that maybe not everyone understands how this uh, typical scientific 
project our life cycle works and how basically science is made. <laughs> Uh, so we made this uh, five minute uh, animation. We're not going to show it here, but you can uh, yeah, search it on YouTube, for example. But basically we wanted to show how scientists come up with uh, new ideas, uh, what to study, how we collect data and do the analysis, how we actually write the scientific paper and how to publish it uh, and how to do it all over again. <laughs> So we hope really that this kind of helps uh, people to understand how we actually do science and maybe uh, like break some stereotypes and uh, get science closer to us or to people. Ah, someone already got the uh, link, thanks. <laughs> so with that, uh, uh, we would like to thank you all for listening and if you have any questions you can write to us uh, send an email also you can check out the web page and if you want to do more about know more about this uh, science part or wider things we do then you can also have a look at our workbook web page so thank you thank you We can also answer some questions if there are right now. <laughs> when is the concept yeah. going to be the national plant of Estonia? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what I was wondering. This <laughs> <laughs> It's a really good question. I think it's a very justified <laughs> question. Yeah, obviously, everybody seems to love it. Right now it's the cornflower and I think it would be hard to change, but maybe we can have to. <laughs> mm, okay. <laughs> maybe we can do another kind of like a campaign just for changing the national flower of Estonia. <laughs> cool. I think if someone wants to still uh, think about the question, then I would say that it is so nice to see that uh, there is a, like an excellent model species and I mean rivers uh, face the same threats as the, <coughs> as the, as the habitats of the cowslip rivers are also divided by, by dams and straightening and other human impacts and it would be so cool if someone like thinks of a similar really good model species that is easily recognizable that is uh, widely distributed and that has this characteristics that uh, when people observe them, then, then scientists could use it to make some analysis. And also I think it's a really good point that you brought that um, it's a little bit like interdisciplinary that uh, in, on the one side we have the psychologist, but on the other, other side, we also need the communication people to do the work that they are best. Yeah. So in the meantime, does anyone have maybe questions or should we move on? Um, yeah, I, I, this is Mike, Mike from Kenya here. I quite like the, the approach and I was looking through this uh, uh, link that I've been shared here. I was uh, pretty much inspired by the aspect of you, you uh, involving the, the, the young one. I, I quite like the aspect you are engaging the young one in collecting this uh, information. I was keen on just understanding how, how did you engage them in, uh, in, 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 the, in the presentation of this specific data that they collected? Because I am passionately keen and interested in, um, in data and children, especially when it comes to uh, uh, approaches like this, I would be just interested in understanding how did you go about, um, now that they help in collecting, I saw them, I, it was so exciting to see that photo where the kids were all over the field and collecting this information. How did they participate in the presentation of this particular data they collected? Uh, so, yeah, we're really one of like how we got the teachers involved is we just uh, sent invitations to basically every school in Estonia. <laughs> we invited them to uh, 
to go out with the whole class uh, to look at cowslips and we also already like suggested to them that it's really easy task like everybody can manage and it's a, like a good uh, learning opportunity for them as well and uh, the information uh, spread quite nicely and also to kindergarten so uh, really small children participated and because it was what we asked to them asked from them was really simple to just look inside the flower and write down one letter basically and then uh, count them so it was uh, a really easy task for everybody and uh, the children proved that they are very capable of doing science and data collection uh, with us with their teachers <laughs> so teachers of course uh, 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 looked over and explained everything but the children were very like happy to uh, be outside and do this sort of biology lesson and uh, we also actually like most of the data was from schools and kindergartens so the majority of data actually came from schools so that was really uh, really nice <laughs> and we also got to this like different uh, networks like eco schools and uh, so they helped us to distribute the word and we had this um, um, sort of lectures or introductionary seminars or these kind of things for uh, teachers so they would understand what they have to teach and also I think we had some for students as well so they got some like theoretical background from us and then they could actually go out and another thing that I think helped at least in the first uh, years was uh, or not the first years but uh, maybe most like this uh, 2020 and 2021 was uh, actually the pandemic <laughs> because uh, uh, students were at home so uh, teachers had to think of uh, different things to do for them and this was one simple thing that they could tell that okay so go out find some cow slips and do the observations and then this is your homework. Well, oh, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Marianne and Iris, for that. I'm I'm really inspired by what you guys are doing, especially with the children, engaging them in science and uh, and they talk. So so inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I guess if there is no more questions, I mean we can always um, ask more questions in the chat, right? But then we can move on to Victor. Now, thank you so much. This was really amazing and great results. Um, really, really, really cool work. So now let's let's hear what Victor has to say, and then we can have this final round of questions and some discussion, and then we can part our ways. <laughs> okay, Victor. Okay, we'll just set up real quick. Uh, can you see my mouse pointer here on the screen? Okay, cool. So hello, um, welcome, my name is Victor. Uh, I'm studying biology and I'm organizing a project together with my colleague, you can see him here, Sebastian. We're organizing a project from Students for Students together with the LBV Hochschulgruppe, that's the Association for Nature Conservants. And in this group, there are all members from, uh, all members are students from universities. And we're organizing a program where we are talking to students, to other students with mostly non-biological background about limbic ecosystems and about uh, invertebrates living in those limbic ecosystems. And uh, informations I will give you today are mostly specific for European regions, but I think they're not useless for other regions as well. So as you can see here, I think it's not hard to see that I'm, I like to go fishing. <laughs> Maybe that's where my enthusiasm comes from. And here my colleague Zivi, uh, he really likes everything what's in the waters, especially bugs and beetles. And so we came up with this program and we thought maybe that's a good chance to get people closer to the environment, especially to limbic ecosystems. And maybe also to get to know them, how fragile these ecosystems are and just show them how beautiful they are. And so uh, first I want to show you some ecosystems here. So on the left side, you can see a small, it's like a lake, small lake with some water plants in it. And you can see that there's no water current in it, no water flowing. 
And on the right side, you can see a floating river. It's like a small river. You can not see any water plants. I'm not sure what these two are, but I'm pretty sure they're not water plants. And you can see that here's water flowing. And that's the main difference between these two. Here's floating water. Here's not floating water. That's a silent water. And this difference um, is quite important for the animals living inside of it. So um, if we're looking at the silent water again, we can say that in silent waters, the temperature is mostly always higher than in floating waters due to no water current. That's not always the case. Um, there are some exceptions. For example, lakes in the mountains, they're very cold mostly. Here in Germany, it's the lakes in front of the Alps. Very cold, they have very low temperatures, so that's not uh, that not counts for every lake, for every silent water, but mostly the temperatures in silent waters are higher than in floating waters. And this leads also to a higher amount of nutrients, what is very important. So you have more plants growing in here, you also have more plants dying in here, so the nutrient level is pretty high, and also you have a lot of animals living here feeding on those plants, for example, and other animals feeding on those animals who are feeding on plants. So you have a lot of animals living in here, so the, bio, uh, the biomass is quite high. Um, in floating environments, the biomass is not so high because you have, as I already mentioned, low temperatures and also lower levels of nutrients, so there are less animals living in here. Um, but also, animals are getting adapted to those different ecosystems. So for example, here you can see two fish. These are breams, you can find them almost everywhere in Europe. And they're very high adapted to uh, silent waters because they're non-aerodynamic, they have very high backs, very flat. So they are used to swim in still waters with no current. Um, you can find them, for example, in rivers as well, for example, in Danube. It's not a very fast flowing river, but in the river Isa, I'm not sure if somebody knows it, it's floating through Munich. It's quite fast river, you will never find some of these. Um, on in this picture here, you can see a mudfly larva. It is highly adapted to live in the mud in the, uh, at the ground of lakes. And here you can see a plankton, that's a Daphnia and that's a Cyclops. And these two are, are also, they. They also live in floating water, but only in areas where the floating is very narrow. So, um, or otherwise they will be just washed away. Mostly you can find them in silent water. Uh, in this, these two pictures, you can see fish from floating waters. You can see a barbel over here and here that's a trout. Um, these fish are highly adapted to floating waters. You can see that they're very aerodynamic and they also have a very strong caudal fin to stay in the current. And here you can see some uh, mayfly larva. Um, I'm not sure if it's possible to see it in this picture, but they're very flat. Um, they're adapted to sit on stones, for example, in the water current and not uh, get, um, uh, without uh, noticing any resistance of the water flow. Um, but floating rivers have a very special uh, habitat for evertebrates, and that's these gravel bottoms of the rivers. Uh, it's called gravel gap system. Um, you cannot see any animals in this picture here for uh, maybe this mussel here, I'm not sure if it's living or not, but the other animals are hidden. Um, we were netting through, these, uh, through this kind of gravel gap system, put them in the top, and over here you can see the animals living in it. So here you can see a lot of freshwater shrimp, a lot of uh, caddisfly larva. Here's a mayfly larva sitting on a snail, for example. A lot of snails and all these animals are living in this gravel gap system. So um, you can see, for example, here some holes or gaps between the gravel. So that's why it's called gravel gap system, uh, where the animals can hide from the current, from the water flow. And also the animals are digging into the sand, for example, to hide from the water flow. So this is, this is a habitat specific for floating waters. And it's very interesting. It's very high on, on taxa, on species. And it's very interesting to look into this. 
Um, another interesting thing is, uh, it was already mentioned today, that you can use insects you find in waters as bioindicators. The things I will tell now are specific for Germany. I'm not sure if there is something like this for other countries or maybe for other continents, but this one is very specific for Germany. So in Germany, we have the water quality class system. And it's uh, a system which tells you if uh, water you have found has good or bad quality. And that's um, uh, counted in four different units. So you have water quality class one, it's unpolluted or very less polluted water. That's water where you can find, for example, stonefly larva, flat mayfly larva, as I showed you before, some kind of caddisfly larvas, and also some kind of mussels. Um, in water cl quality class two, in moderately polluted water, you can find freshwater shrimp, also mayfly larva, but other kinds as in the waters before and also caddisfly larva and some kind of snails. For example, um, the river lumpets. I will show a picture afterwards. And in water class, uh, quality class three, in highly polluted water, you can find aquatic isopods, some kind of leeches, and some fly larva, for example. And in water quality level four, uh, this, that's excessively polluted water. You can find mudfly larva, tube effects, or some kind of uh, midget larvas. Uh, what's very important about this is that you can only take this table in account for floating rivers or floating waters. If you do this in silent waters, it can be a uh, wrong detection. For example, the mudfly larva is, uh, you will only find them in floating rivers with a water quality class of four. But in silent waters, you can find them in every water quality class because they just need mud and um, you can find mud almost in every silent water. And so it's not necessary for them if it's excessively polluted or unpolluted. So you will uh, only can get this table in account in floating waters. Uh, and that's quite interesting because in Germany or especially in Bavaria, you're learning this uh, kind of table to get the uh, fishing license here. So there's also a kind of uh, citizen science, I think, because it's not necessary to catch a fish, but it's very interesting that people who need to get a fishing license here have to learn this. So here are just some pictures for uh, the different animals you can find in different water quality uh, classes. So that's some uh, stonefly larva, for example, here are the flat mayfly larvas. That's the river lumpet, the small snail you can find in water quality level two. Here's some freshwater shrimp, aquatic isopods in water quality class three, some leeches, this leech, for example, parasites and ducks. Um, here are some larvae of Stratomidae, also in water class quality, uh, water quality class three. You can find the uh, mudfly larvae and some red larvae of Hieronymus. Okay, so here are some tables for determining evertebrates, um, for, for kinds of determining evertebrates. I think you may already know some, but I will just explain to you for those who don't know. Um, they're in German, but that's not necessarily, for now I will just explain what they're meaning. So here on top, you can see a key for determining a special kind of snail here for the snail family Radix. And these keys work in a special way always. So there are two uh, questions for mostly one characteristics of this family. And they're mostly asking if a characteristic is there or not. And you can just answer them with yes or no. And then you go on with the next question um, at this number. And so you end up at a special, or, or at the family or a species and you know what you found. Uh, this table down here works kind of the same way. You have the uh, characteristics here and the families are listed over here and you can just uh, look at your animal you have just caught and compare it with the crosses for the characteristics and see, oh, my, my um, animal has the characteristics of this, this and this, for example. So you know it's uh, an animal of the family uh, listed up here. Another way to determine evertebrates is just by comparing it with pictures. 
from literature. It's pretty easy, but it's not very safe. So here you can often make mistakes because the morphology of animals often is quite dynamic. And you can use pictures for uh, determining, but be careful with it. Um, but often it's very difficult to determine the things you've found. Uh, sometimes it's even impossible. You have to preparate them and look at the genitals, for example, to know what kind of beetle you've just found. And that's very hard, uh, especially for people who do not know how to do this. So sometimes it's easier to take good pictures and upload them to iNaturalist. I think a lot of you know already what iNaturalist is, but I will just quickly explain it for those who don't know or who did not have used it. It's a software where you can upload your observations and you do, do not have to determine them. You can determine them and upload them determined and get, for example, um, your uh, observation ID. Or you can not determine it, upload it and get it determined by other people who maybe are specialists on this kind of animal. And afterwards, you will know what you have found there. So. Now I will talk about how to collect. You will need some special kind of equipment. You will need a net with a strong frame because if you're netting in a river with uh, a lot of gravel on the bottom, for example, you will not hurt your net with a strong frame. Or for example, uh, collecting animals under roots or stones will not hurt your net. And you will need a mesh size of about 0 0.5 to one millimeter. But I think one millimeter will be quite big. So uh, the smaller, the better, because then you will collect all the animals you need or all the animals that are in the water. Um, another thing will be small tubs where you can pour your insides of the net into. For example, here is some picture of them. Um, it's better if the tubs are wide because it's easier to see the animals you have uh, caught with your net. So just pour your things into the tub and just look at them and they will get out of the stones and uh, woods and all the stuff by themselves. Um, you will need rubber boots to get into the water quite deep. And you will also need tweezers and pipettes to get the animals out of your sample and maybe put them in a cup magnifier, maybe one like over here, to observe them better. And if you have one, you can take your camera with you to take good pictures to maybe upload them to a naturalist later. So um, now I was talking how to collect and here's an example where to collect. So in silent waters, it's not that necessary where to collect because there are all, almost animals everywhere, but there are some hotspots. So regions with plants or water plants are always full of life. So there are all kinds of snails or other invertebrates living. So there you can always catch something also branches, big stones or roots in the water are also very good hotspots. Uh, you can also net through the mud because a lot of animals are living in the mud, they're hiding in the mud, waiting for the prey. For example, like this uh, water scorpion over here. And you will find them only there. So like this uh, mud fly larva over here also hides in the mud and you will catch it if you net through the mud. Um, yeah, be careful with this uh, back swimmers because they can sting and it can be painful. So yeah, in floating waters, it looks a little bit different. Uh, in floating waters, uh, you can find animals in regions of slow water flowing, so because they're hiding there uh, from the current. Also branches, big stones and roots in the water, hotspots, same as in silent waters. And another thing is to check the gravel gap system I've mentioned before. And there's one technique that is very nice and very common, it's kick sampling. I'm not sure if you know it, but I will quickly explain it. Um, as you can see in this picture here, uh, you will just put your net on the ground uh, in the direction of the stream flow. Then you will kick up the stream bed with your boots and this will lead to as the animals leaving their habitat and leaving their hiding spaces and the current of the river will just uh, flow them into your net. So it's a very nice method to collect a lot of animals in uh, less space. You can also do this in a lot of places and it's very nice to find animals you would not find in other techniques. 
So now I want to talk about why we collect data or why we do this collection. Uh, collecting data is a big contribution to science and I think that all kinds of data is unique because ecosystems are very fragile, especially aquatic ecosystems. And we do not know how these ecosystems will look tomorrow. So the things we will collect today will be, maybe will be different tomorrow. So everything is unique. And even if the data will not be used in, I don't know, tomorrow to, to next week, next year, there will be some use for it in the future. Uh, I have a nice example here. I'm working with louse flies at the moment. And here's a picture of a louse fly I've made in the Natural Museum of Stuttgart. This louse fly doesn't look that nice. So it's quite old and it was found or it was collected 1856. That's 166 years old. And I'm not sure if it was contributed to science yet, but it has definitely its contribution to science now. So I think that's quite nice. And here on the last slide are, is a collection of animals we have found during our project in the rivers. And yeah, enjoy the pictures. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, just ask me. Great. Thank you so much, Victor. It was a great presentation. I think there are some questions in the chat. I'm oh, sorry. Yes. I, yeah. I have not looked in the chat. Yeah. So, yes, ask if there's a practical guide for the bioindicators, like for citizen scientists. I'm not sure. Um, I don't think so. I have a guide for Germany because I have one from my fishing license I've made years ago. But I'm not sure if there's a, a practical guide for citizen science in general. I think I have to look it up. Thanks. That would be actually really nice to have something easy and understandable for a broader audience. Because I've seen um, these B indicators a lot, not only in biology, but also, come, yeah, it's, it's something very that arises uh, very often in water quality studies um, and I think this is a very helpful tool for citizens to measure their water quality but never never there is like a, something easy to grasp or to, to explain this in an easier way to, sign, to a citizen scientist. Normally it's yeah you check the old books and then you explain them or you translate this information to them but if there is something like that that will be mind-blowing. Also to okay. share with my own uh, fellow um, friends. Yeah, I think it will be quite difficult because I think the bioindicators differ for the regions or, or, or they're quite different for the regions we're living in. So I'm not sure if the bioindicators for Germany will be the same for Austria, for example, or maybe for, for Slovenia or something like this. So I'm not sure if there's something general you can take and just compare, for example, South America with Europe. I'm not sure if there's something like this, but um, I can look it up. And if I'm finding something, I will just share it with you. I think uh, as a side topic that uh, this is really important thing to maybe discuss in a, another webinar that, that, that there is often no like clear and simple guide for freshwater or water aquatic invertebrates or such thing because I mean they are hidden underwater and there are like lots of books and uh, like uh, outlets booklets to to plants and uh, animals that live on the ground but but uh, the waters that are hidden they are so underlooked and 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 there is not so many observations in high naturalist also when you compare to the to the uh, terrestrial, terrestrial habitats. Can I share that uh, some countries or region are more lucky than others? Like let's say US and Europe have a more history of um, documenting and monitoring some particular species. And sadly for some of us, like in Latin America and Mexico and uh, 
some other countries, we do not have like a clear idea of what species are in our river. This is why it's like really important to have all this information. And Jens, there is no single guy that can put all the, all the information together. I am lucky enough to have like this little help to get to know like aquatic insects. In, this works like a general rule. I don't know if this is available like in a PDF or something like that. But again, uh, there's no way that one guide will apply to all of the rivers or, or watershed that we are working. So, yeah, I agree. Of course, is ecology changes from one place to the other. But at the same time, uh, from my perspective, working in environmental education, there are ways to somehow um, find certain generalities that may apply in general to all rivers, not, not maybe uh, every species, but certain uh, groups of species, or at least the methodology that one follows to measure. For example, just understanding that a community shift from uh, a healthy river to a uh, um, polluted river, it's, it's already quite big, you know, and, and I haven't seen proper guides, at least in Spanish, maybe in German, because Germans have a lot of guides for everything uh, on that. On, for example, yeah, whole insects or like macroinvertebrates that inhabit uh, water uh, or freshwater streams may show uh, shifts in their composition so of their community. So that means something is changing. Maybe it's because uh, we are here from different countries, so if somebody comes from the Latin American countries where we speak Spanish, has some experience with that, but at least I haven't, I haven't seen. I have just seen outlets, tiny outlets, not, not something that somehow communicates this for citizens, because I think it's, it's proper to do it. Uh, and when you communicate this, you don't have to be so specific. You can generalize a bit, understanding that there are certain things that are more important for the general public than than the, the specific scientists. But yeah, this is a really nice, this is quite a broad topic that may discuss, which is the intersection between science communication and water monitoring and so on. Yeah, and also, I mean, that could be um, kind of like an idea of these individual bio blisses, right? It would be a nice way if somebody monitors their river uh, in one bio blitz or another to collect and over years maybe even compose such a guide them like themselves you know collecting the the with good pictures and already some kind of knowledge of water quality actually that could be coupled together and then um, a little project can actually produce something for this specific river uh, in this specific area I think that that these kinds of things would be also interesting to see yeah cool are there any more questions okay yeah i just wanted to show like this is what i meant like we just made this native forest guide and it's i like tiny easy to see like we have the species so my point was yeah maybe if somebody here is keen on doing something like that this is not hard we did this in two three months with a nice the graphic designer and then we have a field guide for our local ecosystems so that yeah that looks very pretty and nice so that's 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 very interesting to make just a local Local guides are always very in, like impressive for, to me, and I always like like to check them out because they are usually even more specific than sometimes having like um, or more correct than having like a global um, guide. But yeah, cool. Then I think if there are no more questions, we can conclude this session. And I really enjoyed this workshop. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Victor was great, and Iris, and um, oh, I forgot the name, <laughs> uh, <Okay>. Mariana, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, but thank you all, really, it was great, and we had a lot of fun on this workshop, so if anybody has some more questions, or if they need some advice or tips for anything about creating your own project, you can always contact us, and yeah, that's great. 
Carlos, you mean photo like we all with the camera on? Okay, cool. Maybe we could do that also to then share it in the WhatsApp group so people see we work together and sharing knowledge about science and citizen science. Thank you, Yelena and Jürgen, for the organization. It was a really nice uh, webinar session. So if you can turn on your cameras, please, and so we can share, and share are you, a last are you making picture the photo? of we all. Are you taking the photo? Who's taking the photo? Who's, I, my, my hands are on the air. Okay, I'm going to do it. You're taking it? Uh, here's... Okay. okay. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. So, by the way, just one, uh, one last information. We're having an intersectional chat next Monday, uh, 12th, uh, 3 p.m. Germany time. Um, so, what we will we will announce that in the in the WhatsApp group, and that will be a chat about um, how race, gender, class, and religion issues are also part of like environmentalism and how start a conversation on how to make more inclusive naturalism and science and also um, or or work uh, in citizen science. So you're all welcome to join us on Monday. Great. Well, thank you all. It was really fun. Bye. Bye. See you on Monday. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.